Why does the greatest spiritual story in the world advise us to be indifferent to everything, including desire, wealth, and duty? Let's find out. In Sanatana Dharma, Hinduism, there are the four Purushatras, which include Kama, desire, pleasure, if you will, and then Artha, which is wealth and or worldly prosperity. And then there is Dharma, which means duty, following your own virtue, so to speak, following what is natural to you in that society, following what brings the best out of you for the collective. That is your Dharma. And then there is Moksha. Now, Moksha means liberation, self-realization, enlightenment, if you will, which is ultimately going beyond the other three aims of life. And so a lot of people don't really know what to do, how to go beyond those aims. And often a lot of people will just live within those first three Purushatas. And so they just want to be a good person in society. And look, there's nothing wrong with that. But to attain moksha, we need to go beyond those as well. And in one of the greatest Nididhyasana texts, the Ashtavraka Gita, there is a verse on going beyond those three Purushatas. Now, a Nididhyasana text is a text that one comes across after enlightenment or on the cusp of enlightenment. These texts are different to the Prashyana Trahi, which are the Bhagavad Gita, the Brahma Sutras, and the Upanishads, which make up the core philosophy of Vedanta. But then you have the Nididhyasana text. And I've done many episodes on the Nididhyasana text, not just the Ashtavraka, also the Avaduta Gita as well, and the Yoga Vashishta. And there's also other ones like the Tripura Rahasya and the Mandukya Upanishadakarika and so forth and so on. But these texts are usually isolated to those who want to actually embody liberation, who want to dedicate their life to the spiritual path. Not just the cultural aspects of the tradition, not just being a good person in society, but actually dedicating your life to the spiritual path. To the point where in India we see sadhus and yogis who have actually renounced the world. And I'm not advising that you need to renounce the world like that, but you need to renounce the world that you've built within your mind. And that's where the Ashtavraka Gita comes in. Now, in the Ashtavraka Gita, I want to explain to you this very important verse in relation to the four Purushatras and how we need to be indifferent to the first three Purushatras. Cultivate indifference to everything. Having given up kama, desire, which is the enemy, artha, worldly prosperity, which is attended with mischief, and dharma, performance of good works, which is the cause of these two. So you see here, dharma is the cause of kama and artha, right? And that makes complete sense because it's the grounding of those other two. Without dharma, without providing a certain duty through good works, then you're not going to benefit anything from society. You won't accumulate wealth and then you won't also then have pleasure and you can't fulfill these artificial desires that society create. Now, I'm not talking about natural desires of just eating and getting a nice home to live in and also just taking care of yourself in general, like the very fundamentals of life. A lot of the karma in the Purushatras is related to these sort of artificial desires in society, which your dharma can feed, right? But it can also then become a problem. And so in the verse, you actually see Ashtavraka say that karma is the enemy. Now, why he says that karma is the enemy is because the desire for sensual enjoyment obstructs your attainment of the ultimate knowledge of Brahman, the ultimate knowledge of the undifferentiated consciousness of oneness, the non-dual reality. It obstructs that and actually binds us to the world. So karma binds us to the world, right? Because we're, we're always under the spell of desire and desires are never fulfilled, right? Our desires are insatiable. And so we just continue to chase our desires and so we are then bound to the world. The desires are the world. That's what the Ashtavraka Gita actually explains. The desires are the world. So we're continually chasing desires and we forget the ultimate nature of Brahman because the enemy of sensual enjoyment, the enemy of pleasure and desire eclipse our attainment of the ultimate knowledge. And then Ashtavraka after that obviously attacks Artha, right? Attacks the 
worldly prosperity aspect of our life, the idea of accumulating wealth and taking care of one's life. Now, this becomes an obstacle, obviously, on the path to moksha and has to be transcended for many reasons. But Ashtavrika really highlights the problems with Artha in this verse. Because according to Ashtavrika, the acquisition and preservation of wealth leads to bad habits that are detrimental to our higher nature. Right, And we see this in the modern world where a lot of people are so centered on the art, the aspect of life, are so centered on wealth and prosperity, and then that destroys their inner world. This is why a lot of people will label sometimes very rich, snobby people as being almost soulless because their whole life is focused on a number in their bank account, and they constantly live in this fear of having no money but they forget to live as a consequence. And so this leads to all sorts of terrible habits because then we live in a place of protection. We're trying to protect what we've created without realizing that upon death, all of this wealth means zero, means nothing. And Ashtavrika says that that is one of the reasons why it's detrimental to our spiritual path. It'll lead to all sorts of bad habits because we're in this security and protection mode. We are so fearful of losing what we've created, in air quotes, and so we forget to live, and obviously we forget the nature of existence itself. And obviously, Ashtarika mentions dharma being the cause of the other two. So dharma itself is something that we need to transcend as well. Now, this kind of leans into a lot of the deeper aspects in Advaita Vedanta, also into aspects in Buddhism, in Theravada Buddhism, Vajrayana and Mahayana Buddhism, where you have this focus on the end of will. So when I say will here, the, you know, the will to do something. So the end of that, right? The will is what drives the dharma and then drives the need for karma and artha. And so Astravaka is implying that we need to also transcend that will that is built on, in some sense, the society around us, which fuels our innate skill to do something. And so it's not that that innate skill is evil in and of itself, but it can become an obstacle, as Astravaka said. It can become an obstacle because we can use that skill then to accumulate wealth, to chase our desires, and so forth and so on. So in order to attain moksha, we need to transcend those three aims of life. Now, that may seem difficult, but that's why we have these Nididhyasana texts. We have these Nididhyasana texts to guide us beyond those three aims so that we can embody moksha, so we can live it, actually. We aren't giving lip service to it. We aren't faking it. We actually are in that because we have transcended all of those aims. And so Ashtavrika is saying to us that the absolute Brahman, the ultimate reality of existence, that within you and me which is Atman, the undifferentiated consciousness, cannot be reached and lived in permanently when there is the least speck of desire within you. It cannot. And so what you realize and what Ashavrika is trying to wake us up to the fact of is that without desire, those three aims are meaningless. When there is no desire, there are no karma, artha or dharma. All three evaporate. And that is what is required to come into the fourth Purushatta, moksha. And so this is the necessity of transcending and renouncing those three aims, as Jastavrika said, because once we do that, then our consciousness is opened up to the ultimate reality of the Atman within you, which is identical with Brahman. You have completely opened, and there's nothing eclipsing your perception of reality. You are not seeing the world through Maya, the illusion of measurement anymore. And because you're not seeing through the illusion of measurement, you're not chasing desires, you're not chasing wealth, and you're not even chasing your duty, so to speak, and whatever you are skilled at, because you have come back into the heart of existence itself, which is the Atman. This is what moksha is. The supreme and ultimate self, the supreme nature that you are, is identical with Brahman. And the only way for us to reach that, for us to abide in that, is to transcend the three aims of life, karma, artha, and dharma. Shanti, shanti, shanti.